Hello and welcome to the channel. For today's adventure we're going to be visiting a literal end of the line. You've heard me talk in other videos about the Avontir narrow gauge railway. So it's only fair that I do a video to show you the town after which the railway was named and the location where this railway that runs all the way through the Longkloof terminates. This railway is also the longest narrow gauge that is two foot gauge railway in the world at 285 kilometers long and boasting some other impressive records like the highest narrow gauge bridge in the world at von Stadens. This railway was finished in the early 1900s and was used to transport fruit and goods in and out of the Langkloof when roads were not up to standard yet and the majority of the line seeing its last train all the way back in 2010. The word Avontir is Dutch for adventure and when you start researching the history of this railway and how it was built and how it was operated it definitely lives up to the name. There were some plans to connect Avontir with the coastal town of Nysna, which had its own narrow gauge railway, but that was ultimately abandoned. As we approach the derelict loco and wagon shed, a small emblem can still be seen on the roof. This was the 1970s era South African Railways emblem based on the flying springbok. In this old photograph you can see the original railway line extending past the shed and out the other side. But in modern day we can see this track was shortened to only go halfway into the shed. This was possibly to make room for trucks when they started taking over the freight on the line so that they could also make use of the shelter that the shed provides. An old building stands stripped adjacent to the shed. I imagine that this was used to store parts or maybe small repairs, a little workshop, to work on whatever was parked in the shed requiring repairs at the time. As we exit the shed we head towards the cattle loading dock and we can see a few railway houses on the right. With a small coal bunker up ahead and there used to be a water tower which is no longer there. This station never had a turntable for locos to turn around. Instead it made use of a triangle which serves the same purpose. The triangle is just up ahead past the loading dock. Here to the right we have a small level crossing which then takes us to the railway houses. Which I'm glad to see is still inhabited as it gives them a good chance of surviving into future generations. Originally these houses would have been occupied by the station master, the fitters, the shunters, all the support staff needed to run the station. Walking up to the platform area we can see that most of it is overgrown now. With the station board still intact, the railway line still visible. Coming up to the station building I can confidently say it has seen better days. The last time I visited Avontid the roof was still on the building and there were still some doors and windows intact. As we enter the station building the first door on the right used to be a little storage closet followed by what looked like the station master's office. It was a single office out looking the platform and station area. 
That opening to the left used to be the entrance to the station from outside. It had a small little stoop area and a well kept flower bed between these two rows of bricks next to the stoop. In this last office we see the remnants of a safe and surprisingly it has not been broken open yet or removed from the site. There are a few things that tickle the imagination more than a safe which hasn't been opened yet. Heading back out we can see the loco shed and the goods shed and then the small little rest area where the toilets were and possibly the room where the van Skoer clocking machine used to stand. If you can use your imagination, there used to be a toilet there and also one over there. At some stage the sides of the loco and wagon shed were closed off, maybe to provide some extra shelter for whatever was inside. Crossing the railway line again we get to the goods shed with the main shed in the distance and the canopy where the forklifts used to run up and down. This is where they used to load all the farm produce onto the train for transport back to Port Elizabeth. I imagine the edge to the right would be for the trucks to get their goods loaded onto the platform. And then loading it onto the train would be for the side facing the railway line. Inside the shed we find two occupants, which obviously aren't that excited to see me. But other than the broken doors and a few gaps here and there, the shed is remarkably intact, especially when you compare it to the station building. We find another little room adjacent to the good shed that is remarkably similar to the one at the last station we visited. It's the same size and has the same staggered brick design on the front face, which means it might have needed some ventilation or cooling effect. To the left of this building is the foundations of the old farmer's co-op, which was used to store produce and farm related equipment pertaining to the station. This building has since been removed, seemingly with its entire foundation as well. This piece of foundation looks like it used to be a loading ramp of some sort with the railway line itself slowly disappearing under the grass. We are now walking next to the railway line out of the station, pointing east, back towards Fort Elizabeth. With all the tracks in the station eventually merging into one, leaving town and back into the Longclerf. Walking back into town via the pothole ridden main street, I have a small surprise to show you. So when the railway was gearing down for closure, a decision needed to be made what to do with all the extra locomotives which were now no longer needed. Lucky for us at that stage there was a big focus on national heritage so the decision was made to take some of these locomotives and plinth them at various towns all around South Africa to pay homage to our heritage and acknowledge the significant contribution that these machines made to our economy. By all accounts 
These small towns such as Avantide would simply not exist without these magnificent machines that link them to the main city centers in order to get produce out and goods and supplies in. This loco's unique number was 147, being of an NG15 class, was built all the way back in 1957 by Henschel in Germany and served its first two years at Sumeb Copper Mine in Namibia before being transferred to the Avontide line in 1960, where it carried out another 30 years of service, transporting goods, passengers, cement and fruit up and down the Langkloof Valley. It is impossible to estimate the mileage that this machine has covered or the tonnage that it has hauled during its time. But for people such as the petrol station owner who has taken it upon himself to look after this beautiful loco, the significance of the mark that these machines have left on history does not go unnoticed. And as long as we pass this history down to the next generation, the memory of these machines will never fade into obscurity. As for the station building and the other infrastructure, that is the very reason why I'm doing this video. I wish I'd done this video 20 years earlier, but we are where we are, and this is the current state of the end of the line of the Avanti Railway. Whatever happens from here on out, at least we've got a record of what it looked like today, so that we can show future generations the history and the heritage of what used to be. As always guys, if you got any extra information or photographs or anything to share, please leave it in the comments below. I love reading your stories and your personal experiences about the sites that I visit. If you like trains, stations, railway lines and abandoned things, please hit the like button on this video. It's the only way that I know to keep making them. And if you like to be kept in the loop about future videos on this channel, please hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching guys and I'll catch you on the next one. Cheers.